Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney if he break Heritage Ministries and we welcome you to this week's Focus Israel Report. In this week's report we're going to be sharing with you an examination of the history of the relationship between the Obama administration and Israel and it is as follows. When Michael Oren was named Israel's ambassador to the United States in 2009 he set out to learn as much as he could about the America's new President Barack Obama. A historian by training, Oren read Obama's works, including his memoirs, and concluded that the new leader would pursue a new foreign policy approach, including a direct outreach to the Muslim world, a renewed effort to work with international institutions such as the United Nations, and a recoiling from a dependence on American military power. Oren presented his conclusions to the Israeli government. Not all of them were easy to hear, he said. Said, not all of them were palatable. In an interview with Frontline, Oren, who now serves in the Israeli Knesset as a member of the Kalanu political party, speaks about the issues that occupied his time as ambassador, including the peace process with the Palestinians and the Israeli settlement policy. He was asked, In your book, you write that when you get the job, you do research to try to understand as much as you can about who Barack Obama is. What do you discover? And what what do you tell Netanyahu about it? He answers, I had come into the job as ambassador not as a career diplomat but as a historian and I used a historian's tool to try to understand the man who is now the leader of the most powerful nation on earth and Israel's most important ally. It was my job as ambassador basically to the degree that I could to get into his head and to see the world the way he saw it so that we could know where he was going and whether we could adapt ourselves to this world view. I had to look at the things that he himself had written in his books. He had written a book shortly after his graduation from Harvard Law School. This was in the 1990s before apparently he's contemplating running for President of the United States. The book entitled Dreams of My Father is an incredibly candid book. It's a window into someone's soul. I read it many times. I have a dog-eared copy of this book. What I discovered was there was a very interesting individual, a very complex individual but a person who had a world view. And I began to piece together that world view and to make certain assumptions and conclusions and then present them to the Israeli government. Not all of them were easy to hear. Not all of them were palatable. One was that, yes, Barack Obama was a transformative president. Not only the fact that he was the first African-American president, but he was there to change many aspects of American foreign policy. The most obvious one, the one that most directly affected Israel, was the outreach to the Muslim world. The president referred to himself by his full name. He, in virtually every speech, beginning with the first inaugural address, referred to his Muslim family ties. His first trips abroad are to Turkey and to Egypt. His first foreign interview on TV is with Dubai Television. And the message is always the same. I am the bridge. A big part of my family are Muslims. Here is the bridge. There's a line in the Cairo speech of June 2009, which is an extraordinary line. He says, I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was revealed, which in itself is an extraordinary statement citing it. And so he's asked why. And he answers, why? Because first of all, it's the first time to my knowledge as a historian that a president of the United States addresses the world's adherents of one faith. It's the center of the Al-Azhar Rectory, one of the great seminaries of the Muslim world, of Islam over the centuries. And he's making this address to world Muslims. Muslims, so it's an extraordinary event. The address itself is twice as long as the second inaugural address, a very long speech, and there are many aspects of the speech which have direct impact on Israel, the most obvious of which is the condemnation of settlements. Linking Israel's existence and justification of the Holocaust, which was a problem from Israel, it belies the Israeli narrative that Israel arose not out of the Holocaust, but out of the 3,000 year connection with this land. And he recognizes Iran's right to peaceful nuclear energy, which was a significant departure from American policy. 
So this was one aspect of Obama's worldview. The other aspect was that the United States would work with international institutions much more, a collegial approach to managing foreign policy. America wasn't going to be the world's policeman anymore. Some of those institutions, like the United Nations, have proven to be quite inimical to Israel over the years. So that in itself was also a problem. There was a recoiling from a dependence on American military power. The president had one statement which sort of stayed with me over the years. The statement was, whether we like it or not, America is the world's leading military superpower, which was a line that you probably couldn't ever imagine former U.S. President John Kennedy, or even Bill Clinton, and certainly not Ronald Reagan. That showed that there was a reticence there, a recoiling from that type of military power. It doesn't mean he wasn't going to use military power. He used it very effectively with drone warfare. All of these conclusions had to be presented to the Israeli government. This is who we're dealing with, to the best of my knowledge. And so he was asked, and what was the reaction from the Israeli government? He answered, I have one more point, if I might. I was on a sabbatical for an entire year in 2008 before becoming Israel's ambassador. It's the first time I actually lived in an American neighborhood, and I was quite shocked. I talk about in my book about the Rip Van Winkle effect and waking up after 25 years and seeing everything change. It was a very different America than the America that I had left nearly 40 years ago, which was very much a WASP-dominated society. This was now a country with a non-white majority. There were no Protestants, no WASPs, on the Supreme Court. Unwed mothers now outnumber wed mothers. This was an interesting America, and it was an America that I saw that Obama was as much a symptom as a cause of the transformations in America. And as early as 2009, shortly after taking office, one of the messages that I gave to the Israeli government is that we have to plan for a two-term president because the transformations, I believed, were permanent. He was asked, we've interviewed many people in the United States who were there at the moment of the creation of the Obama administration and they're in transformative mode. They're also very fixated on the peace process. They say to Obama, not only the things that you've just outlined, that Obama will be different, but there will be this thing that will eventually be called the Obama Doctrine, that he'll unclench the fists, theoretically, of the Arab world, that they'll step back a little bit from Israel, in symbolic, in other ways, and that they'll push Netanyahu around a little bit to get him involved in the peace process. Are you aware of all that kind of churn that's going on inside the earliest days of the Obama administration? He answered, I was. From an ambassador perspective, it was irrelevant who was responsible for the initiatives. I personally thought, and not just personally, I think it was a general Israeli approach that they were ill-conceived, that the notion of publicly pressuring Israel on the settlement issue actually pushed the Palestinians further from the negotiating table than brought them closer to it. Because in the Middle East, if you're getting something for free, why go into a negotiation where you're going to have to pay for it? That was sort of a constant conversation which I had, which other representatives of Israel had with the administration. We understand you don't like settlements. Settlements are controversial in Israel itself. I have certain strong feelings about settlements, but let's keep our feelings about settlements separate from the tactical question of how to get the Palestinians to the negotiating table and to actually sit with us. The fact of the matter is that there was a direct correlation between between the amount of pressure put publicly on Israel in the settlements and the reluctance of the Palestinians to negotiate in the peace process. And eventually, they just walked away from the peace table. He was asked, when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went for his very first meeting in May of 2009 with Obama, you were with him. He answered, I am with him, but not as ambassador yet. I'm ambassador designate. I attended that meeting. The interesting part about it in the meeting, there was a separate of course, there was always a one-on-one -on -one in any meeting, and the one-on-one -on -one between Netanyahu and Obama, without exception, went on at least twice as long as they were scheduled each time. They met, to the best of my recollection, about 12 times. They always went on longer, and they always emerged, usually with a sense of goodwill, smiles on their faces, lots of pats on their backs. Usually we would read the next day, or in a couple of hours in the newspaper, how badly it had gone. In that first meeting of May 2009, the group session was to talk about the Gaza. Keep in mind, Israel had just completed Operation Cast Lead
said in the previous January, only days before the inauguration, by the way, which was a major consideration for Israel in ending the operation. We didn't want to be fighting on the day that Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States. The question was how then to reconstruct the Gaza, which had suffered extensive damage. One problem was there was about a thousand tunnels under the Egyptian border and that you could bring in concrete to rebuild buildings that had been damaged in the fighting. But Hamas would grab the concrete and use it to build bunkers and tunnels. And this became the discussion. But I think that even Netanyahu, from what I came to understand later about the meeting, was taken back by the departure, by the very strong departure on American foreign policy. He was asked, in what way? He answered, to use an administrative term, there was going to be a full court press on the settlement issue and the settlement in Jerusalem issue, which are going to be partially difficult for the leader of the Likud political party. This is a party with a platform and a constituency on the two-state solution. Now, Netanyahu, a month later, would deliver his Bar Elon speech, in which he accepted the two-state solution, but at the time, he was not yet prepared. He had not yet laid the groundwork, and in a different type of environment, in a different type of rapport, you say to the President of the United States, listen, I'm going to come out with this, but give me a little wiggle room here. Give me a little latitude. Let me lay the groundwork for this. Don't rush it. But I don't think he got that type of latitude. My general disposition as ambassador was to say, let's try to be as flexible as possible, certainly on the peace issue, because eventually we're going to have to dig in our heels on the Iran issue. Occasionally, I was successful in persuading people back in Israel that this was the right approach. But every time the prime minister made a major concession, like the Bar Alon speech, or like the moratorium on the settlements, which went from November 2009 until September 2010, he didn't get much credit for it. And this cost him substantially in terms of support in his own party. What we needed is what's known in diplomacy as tailwind. We needed the president to come out and say very unequivocally, this is a major move. This is a great contribution to the peace process. This took guts on the part of Netanyahu. And we couldn't get those statements from Obama. And ultimately, that type of approach strengthened the hands of those who were against making concessions in the peace process. He was asked, the diplomat Dennis Ross of the United States told us in an interview that they were extremely naive about being transformative and that Cairo, in many ways, is a manifestation of that. The decision not to stop in Israel after the Cairo speech in 2009, you're in the area of the world and you're not going to stop in Israel? What kind of signals does that send? He answers, not only they didn't stop in Israel, Obama went to Buchenwald, which tended to fortify the case that Israel's justification emerged from the Holocaust. Now, I don't know if this is too much inside ball, but that's the Arab perspective. The Arab narrative is Europeans killed European Jews, and they dumped the survivors in Palestine, and the Arabs have to pay for Europe's crimes against Jews. And why should Arabs have to do that? Now, this narrative is problematic. Why would you make peace with an illegitimate refugee state of Europeans? So even that, in terms of the peace process, was a step backward. What you want to say to the Arab world, in which Obama, to his credit, eventually did in November 2011, in his speech to the United Nations General Assembly, is the following. Israel is not about the Holocaust. Israel is about a 3,000-year-old Jewish claim to the area. He was asked, but at that time he got some bad advice advice handed to him, or what happened? He answers, I think this was the most centralized American administration certainly since World War II, and I learned early on that the roads of decision-making, virtually without exception, led to the White House. And yes, the president may have gotten advice from his chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, but at the end of the day, the person who really decided was the president himself. Well, that's going to conclude this week's report, where we shared with you a partial examination of the history of the relationship between U.S. President Barack Obama and his administration and the Israeli government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Until we do it again, Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.